Welcome back to our Wednesday evening Bible study time. It's been a difficult time this time of year. We have several people who are recovering from surgeries and the concern of the virus. So we're not doing our evening services through February. We're doing them online. So we welcome everyone who is listening to our study here. Before we begin tonight in Ruth 20, chapter 2, verse 20, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we pray tonight that you would be with us and help us in our study time. Pray for those of our church family and others who are listening who have needs today, many physical needs. Many people are sick and recovering. And Lord, I also want to pray for our country at this time. And Lord, pray that you'd work with these leaders. They need you. They need your direction. They need to come to salvation. And we do pray for that. So be with us and guide us now, Father, in our study time. Help us to learn from your word, as always. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Picking up in Ruth chapter 2, verse 20, we read this. And Naomi said unto her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of the Lord, who hath not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. And Naomi said unto her, the man is near of kin unto us, one of our next kinsmen. Now we begin to see another something that's strange to us, a second law. This of kinsman redeemer. We don't have anything in our laws <coughs> that correspond to this. But it was another way of God's provision, another one of his provisions for his taking care of his people. You see, God gave the law for a land and for a people. The Mosaic law, given by God, was a wonderful system for that day and for that particular land. Ruth, we know, certainly went to the right field. She thought it was by happenstance, by chance, but God is directing the steps. And this was the right field because this man was a near kinsman. Boaz, even though she did not know it at the time, was a near kinsman to her. So here in the book of Ruth, we see the law of the kinsman redeemer in operation. You don't always see the Mosaic law in operation in Israel, but this little book highlights for us the law of the kinsman redeemer, as well as two other laws which we've mentioned before this in our study that are strange to us. One of them is God's basis, the basis on which God would take care of the poor. And it's an unusual way. As we talked about, God would permit them to the poor to go into the fields and the vineyards and to glean after the owner had sent his reapers and gatherers through one time. It was a tremendous way because a great deal was left after the harvest. God's way of taking care of the poor preserve their dignity by giving them an opportunity to work for what they received. It was not, it, yes, yes, in a sense, it is charity, they're giving it out, but they had to work to get it. It was just not a free handout. Now, here in our story of Ruth, we encounter the law of kinsman redeemer. It's stated back in Leviticus 25, and it actually operates in three different areas. It operates in, uh, in relation to the land, and in relation to individuals, and in relation to widows. Boaz was related to Naomi's husband, uh, an Emelic, and, uh, which means, my God is king. It, 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 we could see that possibly uh, Elimelech and, and Boaz's fathers were brothers, which made them cousins, and therefore you could also say that Boaz was cousin to Ruth's first husband. So Naomi tells Ruth that Boaz is one of her near kinsmen. <clears throat> Notice near kinsmen. She doesn't say he's kinsman redeemer, that he will be later, but we will find out there's somewhat of closer relationship. The emphasis is upon near next kinsman. What does that mean? Well, we need to look at the law in relation to the land. In Leviticus 25, 
23 and 24. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine. For ye are strangers and sojourners with me. And in all the land of your possession, ye shall grant a redemption for the land. Now, the question is, of course, how would God do this? Now, remember, did you hear what I said when I read those verses? God says, the land is mine. He can give it to whom he pleases. So, how's God going to do this? Leviticus 25, 25. If thy brother be waxen poor, and hath sold away some of his possession, and if any of his kin come to redeem it, then shall he redeem that which his brother sold. The law of the kinsman redeemer in relation to the land there. Now, let's see it in operation. When these people came to the land, God gave them the promised land. It was theirs. But they occupied it only when what? When they were faithful to God. When they were unfaithful, what happened? God put them out of the land. Basically, he said, this land is mine. I will give it to you for a permanent, perpetual possession. He gave them title to it. They still have title to it today, by the way. It's the oldest title deed in the world. Israel belongs to them for possession. God put them in the land according to tribes. This tribe had a certain section of the land. That tribe had a certain section. If you look probably in the back of your Bible, it will show the division of the land of the tribes of Israel. And you can see where each of the tribe had that particular plot or a portion of the land. He could never leave it. But suppose he became poor. Perhaps he had two or three years or four years of absolute crop failure. You know, famine did come to the land there because of unfaithfulness to God. And so that man had to get rid of his land. He has a rich neighbor who sees the opportunity to, to take a mortgage. Well, he can take it up to 50, a 50 year mortgage. He can take 50 years because the year of Jubilee, and every year of Jubilee, that mortgage was canceled and the land returned to its original owner. What this law did was keep the land in a family. But it's a long way between the year of Jubilees. A man may be middle aged at one Jubilee, and in another 50 years, he's gone on. He's died. So if he had sold his property, he would no longer get it back in his lifetime. But his son would get it, or his grandson. Now, suppose he had a rich relative, maybe a cousin, a nephew, I don't know, and that rich family member is moved toward him and he has a desire to help him. Well, that rich family member could come right in, he could pay off that mortgage, and restore that land to the owner even before the year of Jubilee. I assume that the year of Jubilee, whoever did the redeeming was also enumerated for whatever he had put into the land. That was God's method. It wouldn't be nice if we all had a rich uncle, but we don't. It would be wonderful to have a, that kind of redeemer that would come when you got in trouble and just pull you right out. Now, this is not only applied to property, but it applies. this law also applies to persons. Leviticus chapter 25, verses 47 and 48. And if a sojourner or stranger wax rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him wax poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner that by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again. One of his brethren may redeem him. Now we see that a man may have fallen into a really difficult situation, some unfortunate circumstances. He's lost his property. Not only that, perhaps a drought, a famine in the land. His children are so hungry, he has to come up with a way to feed them, so he sells himself into slavery in order to provide for his family. That poor fellow is going to be in slavery 
until the year of Jubilee. Now, if that year is 49 years away, he's going to spend a long time in slavery. He may live the rest of his life and die as a slave. But suppose, again, he has a rich relative, and that rich fellow comes by one day, and that rich uncle, and he looks over there, and he sees that family member laboring in the field. He takes his checkbook out, and he said, Look, I don't want to see my, na- my nephew laboring in slavery. So he pays off the price for that man. He frees him from slavery. He redeems him, and the man can go free. The kinsman redeemer, of course, is a beautiful picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is our kinsman redeemer. And that's the reason the word redemption is used in the New Testament rather than atonement. Atonement is a covering. It covered up sin, that's all, just a simple covering. But redemption means that a price was paid so that the one who is redeemed can go absolutely scot-free. Now, Christ not only died to redeem our persons, he died also to redeem this earth. You and I live on an earth that someday is going to be delivered from bondage of this corruption, and there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth. That's part of his redemption. So, Ruth, as we look at this, reveals to us the love side of redemption. Here is a man... Boaz, who is a kinsman redeemer, but he doesn't have to act in that capacity. <clears throat> we'll find out as we go through the study that there's another kinsman who is near in relation, a near relative to, to Naomi than Boaz. He had the opportunity to take action, but he turns it down. He has a choice to make. He can redeem or not. He didn't care for Ruth, but you see, as I've mentioned before in the study, it's clear to me Boaz loves her. That makes all the difference. Love makes the difference. You know, God did not have to redeem us. We're lost sinners, every one of us. All of sin and come short of the glory of God. If he did not redeem us, you know what? He could still be a just and holy God. But here's a fact for you. God loves us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Salvation by redemption is a love story. But now, uh, we, we told it here in kind of simple language, but this foreign girl from Moab and Boaz are in the land of Israel now. Things are starting to turn. Remember, they're under the law. That's the reason I gave you so much of that. So let's see, as we read verses 22, 21 through 23 now. And Ruth, the Moabitess, said, He saith unto me also, Thou shalt keep fast by my young men until they have ended all my harvest. And Naomi said unto Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that thou go out with his maidens, that they meet thee not in any other field. So she kept fast by the maidens of Boaz to glean until the end of the barley harvest and of the wheat harvest, and dwelt with her mother-in-law. This harvesting took roughly, probably six, seven weeks, somewhere in that area. So for six weeks or whatever, every day at the end of the the working day, you'd see uh, Ruth coming and do... uh, Bethlehem, not the wise men, not yet, not the shepherds, not yet, not Mary and Joseph, yet, but Ruth and Boaz. Every afternoon you'd see them coming into Bethlehem. Every day. And people were getting to get used to seeing them. You see, Boaz, as I've said so many times in the study, is in love with Ruth. I think he looked and acted like a man in love. He has been touched with something he probably hasn't felt before. And that little town of Bethlehem is gossiping. Probably a good gossip, I don't know, but I think they're probably talking about uh, that most eligible fellow in all of the town has fallen in love. And I'm sure that Naomi 
with whom Ruth lived, could look out the window and see them coming every afternoon. And I'm sure it excited her when she looked out and would see Boaz maybe walking with her. She knows, though, that she needs to do something. She has to help this along. Because, actually, Ruth is in a very unique position. Boaz loves her. He's fallen for her, and he wants to redeem her. It's a wonderful story that we have here. And it's wonderful for us to have a Savior who loves us, who came down to this earth 2,000 years ago, that he might redeem us. This brings us now to chapter 3 of Ruth. We're going to the threshing floor of Boaz. It's obvious that Ruth is not claiming that what she has a right to. She might not really completely understand. So Naomi takes over. We're going to see that she is a regular matchmaker. I can almost hear her singing the words from Fiddler on the Roof, matchmaker, matchmaker. Ruth is in an unusual position. And to understand what's taking place in this chapter, I think it's necessary for us to understand the third Mosaic law that we encounter here. And again, it's a law that's strange to us. We've looked at two of them. Now we're going to be introduced to a third. Also, we have to understand the threshing floor of the day and what was so significant about it. It's essential for us to understand these things. Now, if you think the laws we've looked at to this point are a little strange and unusual, I want you to take a look at this one as I read from Deuteronomy chapter 25, beginning in verse 5. If brethren dwell together, and one of them die and have no child, the wife of the dead shall not marry without unto a stranger. Her husband's brother shall go unto her and take her to him to wife and to perform the duty of a husband's brother unto her. And it shall be that the firstborn which she beareth shall succeed in the name of his brother which is dead, that his name not be put out of Israel. And if a man like not to take his brother's wife, then let his brother's wife go up to the gate unto the elders and say, My husband's brother refuseth to rise up unto his brother a name in Israel. He will not perform the duty of my husband's brother. Then the elder of the city shall call him and speak unto him. And if he stand to it and say, I like not to take her, then shall his brother's wife come unto him in the presence of the elders and loose his shoe from off his foot and spit in his face and shall answer and say, So shall it be done unto that man that will not build up his brother's house. Again, that's Deuteronomy 25, verses 5 through 9. I'm going to tell you right now, that's a strange law, isn't it? As far as I know, this book of Ruth gives the only illustration of it in Scripture. But it must have been enforced many, many, many times over the situation where a man dies childless. Now, here's the situation, okay? Suppose there's a man living in the hill country of Ephraim, known today as Samaria. He has several sons. One evening, one of the boys gets down to the lantern. He polishes it up, trims the wick. He runs out in the dark with the lantern and starts down the road whistling. And one of the brothers says, what in the world is he doing? Where's he going? I don't know. So late that night, they hear him coming back up the road. He's still whistling and comes in, doesn't say anything. They don't ask him anything, but they're wondering about what's going on. The next night, he does the same thing. And now those brothers are getting a little curious. They might ask a few questions the next day. The third day, the boy takes off, then returns. His brothers are waiting for him then. Where have you been? Oh, well, I've been down the road. One of the brothers says, wait a minute. There's a new neighbor down there. Hmm. Well, the brother answers, well, yeah, there is. Don't they have a daughter? Well, yes. Is it true you've been down there to see her, the brothers might ask him. 
well, I'm just trying to be a good neighbor. Do, do what I can. I just been there visiting them. Well, the brothers might say, well, we'd like to ask specifically, have you been there to see the girl? Well, to give you a specific answer, I have. We want to be personal. Are you interested? The brother would probably say, yes. To be very honest, I'm very interested in this girl. Those brothers would say, well, we've taken a good look at that girl. We don't like her. We feel like we ought to have a family huddle because anything happens to you, little brother, means that one of us will have to marry that girl. Here you see, you see the situation. It's kind of humorous, but according to the Mosaic Law, she could claim one of them if her husband would die and she had no children. That is the provision. Well, the brothers are going to say, well, I'm going to marry her because I asked her tonight to marry me. And she said yes. Well, the brothers said, well, we feel like you ought to go through the clinic. We, because we want you to be healthy. Because we're not going to marry her. We're not interested in her. Well, the boy goes ahead. He marries the girl. Then he gets sick. Very sick. And he dies. Maybe, maybe he's... Uh, a bull runs over him, a tree falls on him, he drowns in the Jordan. He's killed in battle. We don't know. But what's the situation then? Well, his wife is now a widow. And she can go immediately and claim one of the brothers. Now, you can believe me, he's going to have a very difficult time in turning her down. Now, suppose he just stands to it and says, I warned my brother. I told him I didn't like you, and I was not going to marry you, and I'm not going to marry you. Then she can basically bring him to court. If that brother refuses to take her to wife, even in the presence of those elders, she can step up to him, take off his shoe, and spit in his face. What that means is he was disgraced. And I'm going to tell you what, a man is usually not apt to go to that extreme. So you can see, it's an unusual law, which puts a, a childless widow in a very unique position. Matter of fact, it changes her position altogether. She can claim one of the brothers. In fact, it's her duty to do so for her dead husband. Well, frankly, I can understand that this is something that tied families together in that day. It made every member of the family interested in who your brother was going to see and who he was going to fall in love with and marry because it couldn't involve all the brothers in the situation later on. That This is God's law. This is God's provision. And there were two objectives that God had in mind, and they're pretty obvious here. And, and there may be others, but there's two that I see. First, is that God wanted to protect womanhood. You can understand that if her husband died and left her without, with a farm and a vineyard and a flock of sheep, she's going to have a difficult time. So she could claim immediately a brother or a near kinsman, and, have to, and he'd have to make an important decision. You see, the law was to protect womanhood. Now, I've heard the you know, people be critical uh, of the Bible being said, well, it's a man's book. Well, that's... So many people are saying that, and they're wrong. Well, when anybody makes that statement to you, tell them to read the book very, very carefully, because it's evident that they haven't. Sometimes you might wonder if a man has, uh, has a chance. He doesn't have a chance here, and that's for sure. God protects womanhood. The second reason I see for this law is that God wanted to protect land rights. God not only gave the nation of Israel the land of Canaan, the holy land, the promised land, he not only gave each tribe a particular section of that land, he also gave each individual family a particular portion or, or a parcel of that land. Each family had their own land. As we have seen, a family could lose it. In the year of Jubilee, Jubilee it would automatically return to the original owner. However, a widow might go out 
and marry some stranger who would gain ownership of that property. You see, God is protecting the family property. The nearest of kin had to be the one to marry her in order to make it possible to retain the title of the property in the nation and in the tribe and in the family. It seems to us a strange law, of course, but apparently it was one that worked in the land of Israel. As we look at Ruth, she's a widow, no children, and the property which belonged to her husband had been lost because she and Naomi were poverty-stricken. She has a perfect right to claim Boaz as her nearest kinsman. And as Naomi had already indicated, he is a kinsman redeemer. The fact of the matter is, Boaz is sweating it out because his hands are tied. Boaz cannot claim Ruth for his wife. It's Ruth's move. She has to claim him as her husband. A little later on, we'll find out what happens to another uh, kinsman, near kinsman, who's actually closer in relation than Boaz, and Ruth could claim him if she wanted to. Boaz doesn't know which one she'll claim. So Boaz must wait until Ruth makes the move. Because Ruth is not making the move, Naomi is going to have to kind of take charge. She's going to tell Ruth, in a sense, you've got to let this man know that you want him as a kinsman redeemer. Well, we're going to see a very strange procedure. For us to understand it, it's necessary to understand the threshing floor of that day. God made a wonderful provision for the people. They were an agricultural people, and a great many of their laws pertain to agriculture, naturally. The law, the Mosaic law, was not only for the people of Israel, it was also for that land. It was adapted in a very particular, a very peculiar way to the land which we know, of course, as Israel. Therefore, we find a law that relates to the threshing floor and the practices of that particular day. Customarily, a threshing floor was located on top of a hill so they could catch the wind that was blowing in order to blow away the shaft. It was the opposite position from the wine press, which was located at the bottom of the hill because it was easier to carry the grapes downhill than to lug them uphill. Makes sense, doesn't it? The wine press, you might remember, was the place where Gideon was as he was threshing grain. The reason for that, threshing grain down there, was he wanted to be hidden from the Midianites, who had really terrorized Israel at the time and would have come and stolen his grain. The angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Don't tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor, by the way, and addressed him, Thou mighty man of valor, in Judges 6.12. And there is poor old Gideon down at the wine press, scared to death, when he should have been up on top of the hill. You can imagine he was frustrated as he pitches up the grain in the air. No winds blowing down there at the bottom of the hill. Everything comes right back down on his head. I think he was pretty d discouraged. And, and when the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, Thou mighty man of valor, old Gideon probably looked around and said, Who in the world are they talking to? When he didn't see anybody else, he turned to the angel and said, Me? You talking to me? You don't mean that you think that I'm a mighty man of valor. I'm one of the biggest cowards you've ever seen. And that's when he actually was the time. But thank God. You know what? He can use a coward. One who is dedicated to him. After all, I don't care if you're brave or not. You're not going to do anything without God. And when Gideon dedicated himself to the Lord, he overcame the Midianites with only 300 men. That should give us a great deal of encouragement today. Now, the story of Ruth also takes place during that period of the Judges. It wasn't a time when, uh, it wasn't a time when Israel had returned to the Lord. So remember that while Naomi was still in Moab, she had heard that the famine, which was a judgment of God, had come to an end. It was over. Israel had probably returned to a, a time of basic tranquility, and the threshing floor was in its proper place back up on the top of the hill. 
Now, let's take a little look at the threshing floor. The clay soil was packed as hard as it could be with a smooth surface. Uh, usually it was circular with rocks placed around the outside. The grain was all cut and it was taken to that threshing floor. Late in the afternoon the breeze would come up. It would blow probably around till sundown and sometimes even until midnight. So as long as there was a breeze they would thresh. Sheaves of grain were spread on the floor and trampled by ox drawing a sled. The people took a, a flail and, and threw the grain into the air and the chaff would be blown away and the good grain would come down to the threshing floor. As long as the wind would blow they would be on the threshing floor working. When the wind died down, whether it was at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock, 8 o'clock, midnight, whenever it was, they had a great religious feast. <clears throat> and at this season of the year, all the families came and they camped all around the threshing floor, which meant that there were a great number of people who were present there. When the feast was over, the men would sleep around the grain. Since the threshing floor was circular, they would put their head toward the grain and their feet would stick out like spokes all around that circular area. They slept that way to protect the grain from thieves, marauders, who might break through and steal it. It was a time, yes, of feasting. It was a time of thanking God for what a wonderful harvest he had once again given them. Several feast days of Israel, first fruits, even Pentecost, were identified with the threshing floor. They would sing psalms. They would praise God for the bountiful, wonderful harvest. I think I can imagine them up there on that hill, looking out into the heavens and the stars out there and singing so many psalms. When reading the psalms, note some of the, you know, how, how many particular ways, how in particular many of them deal with religious feast. Now, we have that understanding, I hope, of the law of the kinsman redeemer as it applied to the widow, and a little idea of what the threshing floor was like. Let's move on. Won't be able to get too much this evening, but we'll move on to verse 1 of chapter 3. Then Naomi, her mother-in-law, said unto her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for thee? that it may be well with thee. Okay, it's the harvest season. Naomi had been watching out the window each afternoon. She'd seen Boaz and she'd seen Ruth coming into Bethlehem. It's been about six weeks, maybe a little more, maybe a little less. The barley was gathered. The wheat had been gathered. Naomi notices that Ruth is somewhat modest. And she's not making any claim on this man at all. She's, Ruth seems to be a very humble young lady. But Naomi notices something that's very obvious. Boaz is in love with Ruth. Naomi asks Ruth if, here's the question, shall I not seek rest for thee? The rest, of course, is, well, what she's at is marriage. What she's asking is, shall I seek a marriage for you? Matchmaker, matchmaker. You remember that at the very beginning she urged her daughter-in-law to stay in the land of Moab and find rest in her husband's house. Now she, she invited her to stay in her homeland and find a husband in Moab. But, of course, Ruth stayed with Naomi, came back. Now Naomi says, let me seek rest. Let me seek a marriage for you now, Ruth, here in Israel. Verse 2. And now is not Boaz our kindred, with whose maidens thou wast? Behold, he winnoweth barley tonight in the threshing floor. Okay, Ruth. Oh, Boaz is, could be your kinsman redeemer. You know what? By the law, you have a right to claim him. Matter of fact, you must claim him as your kinsman redeemer. He can't claim you, but you can claim him. Now, I want you to go up to the threshing floor tonight and let him know that. It's pretty bold. So she tells her in verse, 
Wash thyself therefore, and anoint thee, and put thy raiment upon thee, and get thee down to the floor, and make not thyself known unto the man, until he shall have done eating and drinking. Okay, Ruth. Now, I want you to get cleaned up and all these things, but you wait until the feast is over. Ruth, it's up to you. You have to claim this man as your redeemer. Ruth had been nothing, had done nothing in the way of claiming him, so Naomi is giving her some very definite instructions. She tells Ruth to do four things. I think this is also a picture of what the lost sinner does who comes to Jesus Christ. The first, these first four steps are essential, of course, for the sinner. Here's the first one. Wash thyself. If you and I are going to come to Christ, we're told that it's not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by all the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. Titus 3, five. That's the reason the Lord said to Nicodemus, You may think that you're fine. You're a religious fellow. And you are. But you need a bath, a spiritual bath. You need the washing of regeneration. Nicodemus, you must be born again. And if you're going to be fit for heaven, you must be born again. You must experience the new birth. Someone at one time asked John Wesley why he was always preaching on you must be born again. Well, Wesley replied, I'll tell you, the reason I preach on you must be born again is because you must be born again. You cannot get into heaven, you cannot be saved until you have become a new creature in Jesus Christ. You and I are not fit for heaven until we've been born again, regenerated by the Holy Spirit. Now, Naomi tells Ruth, you've been working hard in the field. Wash yourself, therefore. Now, that's the first step she had to take. Now, the second thing Naomi tells Ruth is to anoint herself. After Ruth's first husband died, I suppose she put on widow's clothing and made no attempt to make herself attractive. She's in mourning. Naomi realizes somebody now, Boaz, is interested in Ruth. She tells her to get out that little bottle of perfume that she's packed away and use it. Yeah, you know, said maybe the perfume was midnight in Moab. I don't know, but I want to tell you. It was an exotic perfume. No, it says, anoint thee. Now that corresponds to our Christian experience. When you and I become children of God, we're babies. I grant that. We're babes in Christ. Also, we're brought to full-grown status where we have we can understand divine truth. And there's something said to the believer about the anointing that he has. You and I have an anointing of the Holy Spirit. First John 220, but ye have unseen anointing of the Holy Spirit, and ye know all things. That is the Spirit of God, is the one who can teach us all truth. <coughs> all of us need the teaching of the Spirit of God. We don't know it all, we never will on this earth. We need the Holy Spirit to teach us. That's the only way we can ever understand the Word of God. The Spirit of God must teach us. That's one of the neglected facts today. Right now, all over the world, in theological circles, they're fighting like crazy over the doctrine of inspiration. And knowing that the Bible is inspired of God is the, of the utmost importance. You know, you can believe in the full, complete, entire Word of God verbal inspiration of the scripture and still be ignorant of the word of God. Why? Why can you believe all those things and still be ignorant? You have to recognize that you can't bring to this book human intelligence alone and expect to understand it. You may understand facts. You may learn certain intellectual things, but only the Holy Spirit can teach you spiritual things. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10, but as it is written, I have not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things 
which God hath prepared for them that love him. But God hath revealed unto us by the Spirit. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God, is able to teach us, and he is able to lead us and guide us in all truth of Scripture. How important is it to have the Holy Spirit as our teacher? But God hath revealed them unto us by the Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. We recognize that when we are born again, we are given an anointing of the Spirit of God. It's mentioned again in 1 John 2.27. But the anointing which ye have received of him abideth in you, and ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things. It is truth. It is no lie. And even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. This doesn't mean that you dispense with human learning or, or human teachers. But you and I today are the beneficiaries of that which has been bequeathed to us by godly men of the past whom the Holy Spirit has taught. God gives teachers to the church today. But not even the teachers nor all the wealth of material from the past can enlighten you unless the Holy Spirit is your teacher. And so Ruth's second step was very important. She was to wash herself, then to anoint herself, and the third thing was to put thy raiment upon thee. I think Naomi said to her, Ruth, you know, you've got a nice little pretty dress back there. I want you to go and, and put it on. You used to wear it when you were married to my son when he was alive. You look beautiful in it. And if Boaz fell in love with you wearing those black mourning clothes, wow, what do you think he's going to do when he sees you in that beautiful dress? Put it on. That's the third step for the believer. When you and I come to Christ and accept him as Savior, we're told that he becomes our righteousness. He not only subtracts our sin. He not only regenerates us and makes us the child of God, but he makes us over in his own righteousness. Actually, it's spoken of as a robe of righteousness. Romans 3.22 describes it this way. Even the righteousness of God, which by faith of Jesus Christ upon all and upon, unto all and upon all that believe. But there's no difference. Paul speaks of it as a garment that comes down over the center that covers him so God sees us in Christ and his righteousness, righteousness becomes our righteousness. We stand complete in him, accepted in the beloved, as we're told in Ephesians 1.6. This is the robe of righteousness that we have today. A book came out a few years ago called The Robe, a movie years ago, and there was an intelligent very d dynamic young woman who was a member of a very large church and she came up to her pastor one Sunday after service and said, I've been reading the book and it's a thriller. So the pastor asked her what book and she said, it's the, ro the robe. The pastor said he was a little discouraged when she said that. She asked if he had read it. He said, not exactly. I have the book. I've looked through it, but I haven't read it in any detail. In fact, I don't care to. The woman looked a little puzzled and at the pastor, and she was kind of amazed, saying, Do you mean to tell me that you're not interested in what happened to that robe? The pastor said, Frankly, no. That seamless robe which Christ wore doesn't have any romantic history. The soldiers gambled for it at the foot of the cross. The fellow that won it, you know, probably some big Roman soldier, it was a it's a hot country there in Israel. You know what? He probably swapped out that robe or threw it away in a few weeks and maybe dropped it in some corner. Some servant picked it up, held it to her nose, and threw it away. That woman was shocked that the pastor said that. She said, that's terrible. According to the story, that the robe has a romantic history. 
The pastor told her that robe has no romantic history at all. But there is one that does. And that's the robe of righteousness which Christ puts over the sinner who will trust him. You and I cannot stand sufficient on our own. We stand complete in him. Romans 4.25 tells us that it was Christ who was delivered for our offenses and raised again for our justification in order that we might have the righteousness to stand before God. For he hath made him to be sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. 2 Corinthians 5.21 And you and I stand clothed in the robe of righteousness. And that one really has a romantic history, that robe. The fourth thing Naomi tells Ruth to do is to get down to the threshing floor and let Boaz know that she wants to claim him as a kinsman redeemer. But that will have to wait until our study time next week. And we're picking up in Ruth 3, 4. Our Heavenly Father, I thank you for the time that we had here. Pray that we people will heal up and strengthen up and be back with us again soon, that we may once again have our services. Pray that you'd be pleased to clear this virus out of our country and out of the world, that we may return to normal and give you the honor and the glory. Father, be with us and guide us in this coming week, giving us the strength that we need. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.